the formation and role of the Ulster Special Constabulary. Now, despite being stood down almost 50 years ago, exactly 50 years ago this year, when you use the term the B Specials in Ulster today, there are very few people, irrespective of age or religious background, that do not know what you're talking about. There will be differing opinions on them, of course, but they are ingrained in the folk memory of the province. Formed in 1920, for 50 years, the Ulster Special Constabulary were a constant thorn in the side of and barrier against all of the excesses of Irish Republicanism in Northern Ireland. And for that, they were revered by Unionism. And also for that, they were loathed by Irish nationalism. A loathing that contributed to eventually an eventually successful campaign that saw their disbandment. But who were, who actually were the B men? In 1919, a new military campaign began across Ireland. It was glamorously called the War of Independence, but in truth, the Irish Republican Army um, terrorist and guerrilla actions were not legitimate warfare in any true sense. Their goal was Irish independence and the removal of all British presence in Ireland. This was while in the north of the country unionists were working directly against the IRA goal. They were trying to partition Ireland and maintain the newly created region within the United Kingdom. In 1920, the Government of Ireland Act created Northern Ireland against a setting of growing violence that had left 40 people dead in a period of just three months. To combat this increasing threat, Sir James Craig and other senior unionists demanded that they should have control of Northern Irish security immediately. This was despite the fact that Northern Ireland would not officially come into existence until May 1921. Now during this period, most British troop resources were focused against Republican ambushes and attacks in the south and west of Ireland. The north needed support for the police within its own territory. At the 1920 12th of July in Belfast, Edward Carson, speaking to the massive crowds, told the British government that if you are unable to protect us from Sinn Féin, we will take the matter into our own hands. We will reorganise. Across Ulster, this had already begun. Groups of Protestants and Unionists, some of whom were ex-members of the British Army and pre-Great War Ulster Volunteer Force, had already started coming together to protect their communities. In Belfast, the Ulster Imperial Guards were a mass movement of thousands, while in our mass city, nightly beats and guards in its streets were being undertaken by what was named a protective patrol. In Fermanagh, the local UVF had essentially been reformed in April 1920 underneath the name of Fermanagh Vigilance. In early 1920, Lord Brookborough visited a Dublin that was in the midst of violent demonstrations, strikes and agitations. And afterwards he noted, It brought home to me how easily Ulster loyalists could be put under pressure, coerced. The loyalists were in great danger. There was murder in the streets of Dublin and arms were brought into the country. I realised we had got to do something to look after our own homes. In his attempts to get an official force recognised, he received a letter from Dublin Castle suggesting that instead of guns, those men who wanted to protect Ulster could be issued with whistles and armbands. When I produced this letter to my boys, Brookborough later told, they shook with laughter. Dublin can go to hell, they said. We look after ourselves. 
Across the entire country, the pre-Great War UVF was gathering momentum. However, James Craig deemed it wiser to form a brand new constabulary organisation. One that would be a support organisation for the regular forces of police and army. This new organisation was to help combat those seeking to destabilise Ireland. And as such the membership was to be raised solely from the loyal population. It was to have a military basis in structure and organisation. It was to be armed and it was to be only for the six north eastern counties. The pre-Great War UVF quartermaster, now also a highly decorated hero of the Great War, Wilford Bliss Spender, was appointed to form and run this new force. The formation of the Ulster Special Constabulary was revealed on the 22nd of October 1920 and announced officially by the British government on the 1st of October 1920. Now the USC was divided um, into several different roles for recruits. A specials were full time and paid. B specials were part time and unpaid although there were several alliances given. And C specials were to be non-uniformed reservists, usually the most elderly, and utilised for guard duties near their homes. There was an additional category of C1 specials, who would be non-active in terms of training or drill, but be available to be called upon in cases of emergency. The force was organised under the existing Royal Irish Constabulary Geographical Divisions with the platoon, the prime working unit. Each platoon was to have 60 special constables, 4 sergeants, 2 officers and 1 head constable. By 1922 there were over 3,500 A specials over 19,000 B specials and over 7,500 C specials. They were to patrol areas with truncheons and arms, stopping IRA operations a priority, alongside combating smuggling and other cross-border illegal activity. In Belfast, training for the men mimicked the regular police, while in country areas it was concentrated on counter guerrilla operations. Initially all air specials were given six weeks training at camp in Newton Ards in the use of arms, drill and discipline. The uniforms did not become available for new recruits until 1922 and in their first year B specials went on duty wearing their civilian clothes and wearing just an armband to signify that they were indeed specials. Existing groups were unofficially welcomed into the new constabulary and with the stockpiles of Ulster volunteer weapons in every county, arms were immediately on hand. It was almost totally Protestant, however attempts were genuinely made to attract Catholics, a task incredibly difficult given that those men became very easy and high profile targets for the IRA. The IRA released a statement that actually condemned any Catholics that joined the new body as being traitors who would be dealt with accordingly. And in December notices were being posted on walls in districts in Belfast warning that anyone who joined would be shot. Now this threat was actually carried out very early on Saturday the 4th of December 1920 when a young Catholic recruit John Milach of Chatham Street in Belfast returned home on leave after having only joined the previous Thursday. Now he was dressed in an S specials uniform um, and while walking along Butler Street to return to camp in Newton Ards he was attacked by four men and knocked to the ground. And while on the ground one of the attackers drew a revolver and fired several shots. Thankfully however uh, John um, received only one bullet wound to an arm that was not life threatening. Irrespective of these threats, recruitment continued and the first ever inspection of the force 
took place on Monday the 6th of December 1920 at Newtonard's camp with a review inspected by Colonel C.G. Wickham, DSO, the divisional commander of the Special Constabulary. From June 1920 to June 1922, over 400 people were killed and several thousand wounded in violence related to the IRA attempt to destabilise what was going to be the new Northern Ireland. The specials were the main barrier interrupting the ability of Republican operations. The IRA tactic of flying columns, small mobile groups coming into an area then quickly fleeing after launching an attack, was largely foiled by the simple presence of Ulster Special Constabulary men on the ground patrolling. The IRA commander of its 3rd Northern Division actually admitted in later years that in 1922 it had been patrols of specials that forced him to continually abandon operations. The vast majority of special patrols were totally uneventful, even boring, but the nature of the role meant it was a dangerous task. In those first few years of existence, some 72 specials lost their lives. On the 13th of January 1921, Police guarding a postman delivering pension money near Cullihanna were ambushed, with the postman seriously wounded. An Ulster special volunteered to recover the man alongside the police, and at 1pm arrived at the scene of the morning ambush in a crossly tender. They alit from the vehicle and advanced in formation to a vacant building that had been the source of the earlier gunfire, when the special constable was hit in the thigh by sniper fire. He was rushed immediately to Louth Infirmary, but about one mile from Dundalk, Special Constable Robert William Comston, aged 24 from Lot McCollum Road, about three miles from Armagh City, had listened ill, died from the injuries he had received. A police constable who had been with Robert stated at the inquiry that the blood ran out thickly quicker than we could stop it. Robert's last words had been, Oh Jack, I'm hit. He was the first death within the ranks of the specials. He was a member of the Killycopple Orange Lodge and his picture still hangs in the Orange Hall today. The postman who had been shot earlier, Patrick Kirk, had been injured in his right lung, lung and he too later died that night. During the Six months, the first six months of 1922, despite now divided internally, the IRA conducted an intensified campaign along the new Northern Ireland border, underneath the leadership of Michael Collins. Several high-profile attacks took place. In South Armagh, the most heinous came on Sunday the 10th of April 1921. That morning, five specials based in Cross McGlain began to cycle to Craigan Parish Church, just in the fringes of the town, for the Sunday service. Not knowing that a large number of IRA had already held up all the parishioners in the church and imprisoned them in a local public house. The party of specials came under attack, leaving three injured and one man dead. Constable James Fluke was laid to rest in the family burial ground at Killalay, Church of Ireland, County Armagh. Others injured in the attack included Constable Linton and Constable Lamon, also from Killalay. In January 1922, specials stopping several cars transporting Monaghan GAA players and acquaintances at Dromore and County Tyrone who were heading to play in an Ulster final in London Derry. Weapons were discovered and 10 men arrested, including the Monaghan commander of the IRA. The Monaghan IRA revenge for this capture would result in the biggest loss of life in any single incident for the specials. On Saturday the 11th 
of February 1922, a train transporting 18 A specials was ambushed at Clonus in County Monaghan. The men had been training at Newton Ards in North Down and were travelling home down a skillen and rather than returning home through Oma, they had taken the marginally quicker journey via Clonus. The rail network having no respect for the new borders and temporarily taking them outside of their jurisdiction. They were required to change trains in Clonus and within the official version of events it states that just before boarding they came under intense machine gun fire. An unofficial account tells how the unit of specials were approached within the train by our men and told to put their hands up. One armed special immediately opened fire and killed the IRA commandant. The specials trapped on the train refused to surrender and a gunfight ensued that left four of their number dead and one wounded. After forcing their surrender, the other specials were arrested while the bodies of the dead men were unceremoniously dumped on the platform. The train continued on its journey eventually pulling into Lisbelaw station, riddled with bullets and blood stained. Upon which site local loyalists forced a number of local Sinn Feiners from the town. The murdered men were, or were Sergeant, Special Sergeant William James Doherty, 23, Special Constable James Lewis, Special Constable William James McFarland, and Special Constable Robert William McMahon. Now, during those years, many allegations emerged of specials retaliating for IRA attacks. But there was little evidence of substance for any direct involvement. When Protestant and Unionist communities were coming under attack, it is of no surprise that counter-attacks occurred. And the Ulster specials were an easy target for finger-pointing from nationalists who were already aggrieved at the success of the force. Before the end of 1922, some semblance of calm returned to Northern Ireland, with the IRA campaign essentially defeated and normal placing duties overtaken by the Royal Ulster Constabulary. This meant less support was needed, and with this, a and C category specials were disbanded. Some protests were held, but the decision itself was upheld. This left the B-men. Uniformed similar to the RUC, and armed with such weapons as Wabley .38 revolvers and Lee Anfield rifles, they became a permanent reserve force. Now, for a short period in 1931, when they were required to relieve the RUC from normal duties during a spell of rioting, the next 20 years were relatively uneventful. The Ulster Special Constabulary continued to drill and train, their weekly patrol and regular shooting competitions being the most action experienced by the vast majority of the men, with large-scale camps of instruction too a regular feature, as were church services, and social functions. Football, tug of war and other sporting, sporting pursuits between platoons, between sub-districts and between counties became important outlets for the men. In May 1940, in response to the ongoing Second World War, Great Britain, the government, um, decided to form an organisation to act as a secondary defence force after the army that would be able to slow down the advance of enemy forces in the event of any invasion. Initially called the local defence volunteers, the name was thought to be some um, to be uninspiring and in June they were rechristened as the Home Guard. In Northern Ireland the fact that there was an existing secondary force muddled the formation of yet another body directly related to the war. And initially, the Ulster Special Constabulary were offered to fulfil the role of these local defence volunteers. And that resulted in the formation of the local defence volunteers section Ulster Special Constabulary. This body trained to oppose airborne invasion, 
whilst also counter any potential fifth column invasion via the IRA or sympathisers. This section of the USC was later renamed the Ulster Home Yard and around 26,000 people joined. During its formation and, Ulster, and evolution, the Ulster Special Constabulary continued to exist as actually a separate organisation. However, it worked closely with the um, Ulster Home Yard until it, it was disbanded in December 1944. Whilst so many from Northern Ireland and, and indeed the Irish Free State, over 40,000, had joined the colours to fight against Hitler, the IRA decided that this would be a good time to once again renew their campaign. In doing so, they reached out to the Nazis for support. In the middle of the war, from Easter Sunday 1942 to June 1944, there were a series of attacks by the IRA across Northern Ireland. Once again, the B-Specials played a significant role in ensuring they would make no inroads. It did not come without loss, however, and two Specials lost their lives during IRA attacks. On the 9th of September 1942, Special Constable Samuel Hamilton died after his patrol was am ambushed by machine gun wielding men in Claudia Village, County Tyrone. He had worked at Herdsman's Mills, Sand Mills, and was buried in Barnes Court Graveyard, Newton Stewart. An RUC constable also died in that attack. On the 10th of October 1942, Special Constable James Lyons from White Abbey was killed during a gun battle following a bomb blast at his station in Botanic Avenue in Belfast that also left another constable seriously wounded. Constable Lyons left behind a wife and three young children. By 1950, IRA activity was at a very low level, largely because of the consistent presence of the B-men. But the possibility of any new campaign was never far away. It emerged in 1956 from a reorganised Republican movement that launched 10 simultaneous attacks across border areas of Northern Ireland on the 12th of December that year, including the burning of a B-Specials post near Newry. Then, on New Year's Day in 1957, they launched what was both one of their most famous raids and yet also an abysmal failure. That day, 12 IRA men entered Brickborough in County Fermanagh, stopped outside the RUC barracks in a stolen lorry and opened heavy fire on the station windows. Just one sergeant was in the station, yet his bursts of stand gun fire managed to wound six of the attackers. An IRA hand grenade thrown at the barracks bounced back and exploded under the lorry, adding to their woes. The terrorists took flight, abandoning two dying colleagues in a bar, and then spent hours hiding from B special patrols before eventually getting across the border. The IRA operation was an unreserved disaster with two dead terrorists, and yet in true Irish Republican fashion they propagandised the events, composing ballads and turning to incompetent and failed revolutionaries into martyrs. Another major success for Fermanagh B specials, specials came on the 24th of August 1958. That day a Cavan IRA commander led several men in an attempt to blow up a customs post at Mullen. Unfortunately for them, a USC patrol was waiting. The patrol opened fire when he fled when they fled the scene refusing to obey orders to halt. In recent times apologists for the IRA have attempted to rewrite the incident by placing the individuals as simply being travelling across the border to buy a trickler for a rally in Ballyconnell. By nineteen sixty two, once again the IRA had drifted into the background defeated. No B specials were seriously injured despite being targets on several occasions. Regarded as being the official historian of the IRA, Tim Pat Coogan said of this period that the B specials were the rock on which any mass movement 
by the IRA in the north had inevitably floundered. In 1967, a new organisation was formed, styling itself a civil rights organisation or civil rights association. People differ on the level of Irish Republican involvement or indeed infiltration that existed within its ranks. What perhaps does tell its own tale is that of five demands it placed into a print, one was the immediate disbandment of the B specials. By this time, the constabulary had a membership of 8,500 who were now mobilised to support the RUC to deal with ratting and violence surrounding and initiated by the new supposed civil rights body. Famously, it was B specials who were most forthright in combating disturbances in Burntullet, Londonderry and Armagh City. And they were largely successful in restoring order on the majority of their mobilisations. Seldom referenced is that in Belfast they prevented the burning and looting of Catholic owned public houses and business. The accusations and witch hunt however was unending and eventually pressure from the final of several reports, the Hunt Report, recommended their disbandment. On the 31st of March 1970, the Minister of Home Affairs, Robert Porter, formally sent out letters to every member of the Ulster Special Constabulary stating the force would be no longer required. On the 1st of April 1970, the Ulster Defence Regiment began active service. In the Scarman Report, just a few years earlier, mistakes and problems with the specials were identified, mostly organisationally. But importantly, Scarman also noted the general case of a partisan force cooperating with Protestant mobs to attack Catholic people is devoid of substance and we reject it utterly. For those with an agenda, anything in the reams of reports they disagreed with was simply deemed irrelevant. For Irish nationalism today, and Irish republicanism today, the B specials are still hated and blamed for every perceived evil and access against their community from 1920 to 1970. Factually, however, those men prevented terrorist attacks and actually ended several terrorist campaigns. There were units in every city, town, village and hamlet of Northern Ireland. They knew the roads, they knew the people, and they knew the habits of entire communities. They were able to stop attacks because they were part of those communities and they cared enough to risk their lives to stop them being attacked. Over 40 years after they were disbanded, 50 years this year, you can still fully understand why today some people look at the state of Northern Ireland and say, bring back the B-men.